Right, this is good morning if anybody is out there. We're going to start at 11 o'clock. I was just making sure that we didn't have any technological issues. Um, this is going to be live lesson four, uh, using structure effectively. Um, as I said, we will get started at 11. So make sure you've got everything you need, pen, paper, water, tea, um, whatever you need to keep you going through the next 45 minutes or so. And we'll get started at 11. Morning all. So just to let you know that we'll be starting in about five minutes or so, starting at 11 o'clock for lesson four of the English language live lesson series. Um, make sure you've got everything you need, pen, paper, drink, something to keep you going. And we will get started in five minutes or so. I'll see you then. Um, I was later told by Okay, morning all. Going to get started in a few more minutes. Um, just waiting for a couple more people to come in, waiting for 11 o'clock so that we can make our official start. You are going to need a pen and paper today. Um, we've got quite a lot crammed into today's lesson, so um, it's going to be a busy one, but hopefully something that you'll find useful. So we'll see you in about sort of five minutes to get started properly. Okay, so good morning everybody. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. I've got my timer set up. I've got uh, my water ready. Really looking forward to going through today. It's quite a packed lesson. There's quite a lot going on in it. Um, so it's going to be a busy one. 
Um, but we're going to be looking at using structure effectively. So some of the features that we looked at in lesson three, where we were analysing how writers use structure, we're actually going to go over how you can incorporate them in your own writing um, to make your own writing a little bit more powerful and to make your own writing a little bit more effective um, and to help kind of hit some of those uh, top mark descriptors for your non-fiction writing, but also for your spoken language endorsement. So we're going to make a start in a couple of minutes, a proper start. Um, just wanted to say good morning to everybody, make sure everybody was there, make sure you've got everything you need set up and ready to go. Um, make sure you've got your workspace, you know, pen, water, paper, dictionary if you want it, so that we are all good to go. Right, OK, well, we're going to make a start. It's pretty much 11 o'clock by my um, clock, so we're going to make a make a start. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the English Language Live Lesson 4, um, using uh, structure effectively. And this is building on the work from Lesson 3, where we looked at how writers employ different structural devices for different effects. And what we're going to have a look is how we can use some of those structural devices in our own writing. Um, we're going to cover quite a lot today. It's quite a packed lesson in terms of uh, coverage. Um, so if at any point you need to pause or you need to sort of stop and get some fresh air and come back again, uh, feel free. It is quite a, a, a rammed lesson. and Hopefully you're going to get quite a lot of, out of it. Um, so for those of you who are new to this, I'm Rebecca White. I've been doing these sessions. Um, I'm a head of English. I've been teaching for over 15 years now. And my aim is to help you use structural devices to plan an effective speech for your spoken language endorsement, um, which is uh, something that some of you may have started, some of you may have completed, um, some of you might not even have a clue what that's about because your school might do it in this term and that hasn't been something we've been able to do. Um, but as well as that, I'm also going to look at some structural features of an article because on the feedback that we had after last week, not last week's lesson, the lesson two with... Um, the writing there were some people who wanted advice about how to write articles because that's what their schools were setting them and so I've tried to fit both the speech and the article into this session so like I said it's going to be busy it's going to be quite packed um, but hopefully you will get a lot out of it all you're going to need for today is a pen and paper you might find it useful to have a dictionary on hand as always um, but pen and paper is the most important thing the typical community rules from every lesson that we've had still stands. We take safeguarding seriously. We're going to treat everyone with respect and we will take appropriate action if needed. We haven't had to do any of that, but um, we are uh, obliged to say that at the beginning. So those of you who've been doing these sessions, um, you've done the other three sessions, you'll know how this works. We cover five key areas um, within the lesson. And in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at effective planning. Um, we're going to be looking at starting strong, so make sure that your openings are really well crafted. We're going to look at some of the structure strategies that you can use within the body of your writing. We're going to look at finishing strong, so ending in a really powerful way. Um, and we're going to look at the SLE, the spoken language endorsement, um, in a little bit more detail, just for those of you who aren't um, familiar with it. Um, so those are the five areas we're going to be looking for. Now, again, for those of you who are new to this, this is how it works. Anything written in blue is something that you have to do. So blue you do is a nice, easy one to remember. Those are tasks that I expect you to do. Now, obviously, I set sort of 30 seconds, 45 seconds or so for you to do the tasks. If you need more time than that, feel free to hit pause 
and then start again, it's not a problem. Um, as well as um, the blue tasks, there are also some purple tasks, and these are tasks that are more of an extension, and these are things that you might want to go and uh, revisit after the lesson. There's ones that take slightly longer to write, um, because obviously you don't want to be sitting here with 10 minutes of silence with me waiting for you to write something. And so those purple tasks are just a bit of an extension for you to sort of come back and revisit later. And then any key terms we cover will be written in red. And we've got two um, sheets of key terms today at the end of the, the PowerPoint. Um, quite a lot of terminology coming in. Some of it you'll, you'll like, some of it you won't need. Um, but it's just to give you a range of devices and a range of vocabulary to talk about those devices. So that if you do spot them in another writer's work, you can talk about them as well, because actually the link between reading and analysing the structural devices of writers is, you know, really strong in terms of using those structural devices yourselves. So we're going to start off with the first activity. And that first activity is to write down a list of things that interest you. So I'm just going to give you 30 seconds for that. Um, to write down a list of anything that interests you. Go. Okay, so I don't know what sort of things you would have written down. You might have um, sort of computer games or TV programs or sport or um, animal welfare or anything at all. But it's really important when you do your when you're prepping for your SLE that you just think about something that you're passionate about, that you're interested about, that you find um, interesting. Because if you can't speak with interest or passion about it, then your audience isn't going to. Um, feel interested or passionate about it um, and even if it's something you kind of almost have to fake enthusiasm for it's really important that you are putting that energy into it otherwise your audience is just not going to pick up on it at all so today's task we've got two key tasks that we're looking at we're looking at writing a persuasive or argumentative speech about a topic of your choice now that's kind of where the SLE element comes in is you'll be talking about something that you choose um, but the second task, like I said, this was one that the feedback forms um, asked for. We're going to look at writing an article for a local newspaper about an event in your area. Now, this is, again, a really typical sort of task that you'll get in the exam. Um, it will be something about writing an article for a local newspaper about an event of your choice, or it will specify the event, you know, a, a music festival or a carnival or something like that, that you can then make a link to. But it's really important that you have um, a bit of an awareness of those types of tasks that are going to come through. And one thing I would really recommend, and I probably should have put this as a purple task, really. But one thing I should I would really recommend is go away and listen to um, different speeches. Go away and read newspaper articles from local newspapers and national newspapers um, because they have a very specific style. And if you've read a few of them, you get. A sort of feel for how that style works on the page and then you can recreate it in your own work and we've talked before about magpieing and stealing ideas from people and there's nothing wrong with that you know if you've read a newspaper article and it's got a really interesting phrase you might think oh I could steal that and use that to make my own article sound a little bit sharper and so it's really um, worthwhile doing that. So we're going to look at effective planning um, to start with and I know that lots of you will have been told by your teachers to plan um, it's something that we talk about because actually a good plan, an effective plan, is something that you can see in the writing because the writing just flows better, makes it easier to read. So when you think about planning, you need to think about not only covering the content, what you're going to write about, but also the order you're going to write it in. And I think there's a temptation to sort of, you know, create a spidergram and throw all your ideas down on the page and then just sort of start writing randomly but you really need to think about the order that you're going to write in so that there is a logical flow a logical sequence of events and in lesson three we talked about the importance of the sequence of events and it's just as important when you're writing your own piece so your planning needs to take into account how your ideas connect how are they going to work together 
So have a look at um, the list of things you, you wrote down at the start of the lesson, the, the things that you were interested in. And I want you to think for some of them, can you come up with at least five separate things to say about them? OK, so, for example, one of the things I'm interested in um, is uh, exercise and sort of exercise for your mental health and well-being and stuff like that. Um, we've got and the five things I've thought about is weightlifting, um, competitive sport, the importance of stretching, the fact that it's really good for your well-being and personal bests. And these are, you know, things that are, are interesting to me at the at the moment. Um, and so those five elements are the things that I've just thought about for the topic of exercise. So I'm just going to give you 45 seconds um, to have a think about five things for each of the topics that you came up with. OK, so 45 seconds. Off you go. OK, now, if you need a bit more time to kind of come up with some things, that's fine. Just hit pause, give yourself a bit of time, have a think. It might be something you come back to later when you've had a chance to have a think about the things um, that you're um, feeling like talking about. And we're going to go over a couple of potential topics um, as we go through and that might inspire you as well. Um, but have a think about that topic. And then we're going to have a think about when you're structuring your speech. And I think this is, for me, the really important bit is how you structure it so that you know how you want to order it. You might find it helpful to have a why STEM topic. So why you should exercise every day, uh, why parkour should be an Olympic sport, why seagulls are better than pandas. And I know this last one seems really daft, but it's one that I use as an example quite often in my class um, because actually it allows you to sort of employ the rhetorical devices and it's something a bit, you know, fun and daft, but actually you can make quite a convincing argument. And I think sometimes that's worthwhile having. Alternatively, you might want to set up a debate question. So do we need to exercise every day? Should parkour be included in the next Olympics? Are seagulls actually better than pandas? You can set up those questions um, as a way of sort of answering them in your speech. And then you're going to achieve the purpose of your speech, which is one of the key criteria for the higher levels on the spoken language endorsement. I want you to... Later, this is a purple task, so this is a do later task. I want you to look at the topics you selected earlier and then see if you can turn them into a debate question or a why um, statement. So you might have something about... Um, I don't know, so I know that one of the things that was going to be on the Olympics this year was um, elect uh, electronic sports, um, sort of online game sports as, a, as an Olympic sport. Um, and you might want to have a think about that idea of gamers being regarded as athletes um, and sports people. And that might be something that you think about, you know, um, should online gamers at the Olympics be considered athletes or um, why there is a place for online gaming in the Olympics? Um, you can have a think about those sorts of things as a way of setting up those statements. Um, and that might just help you think about, well, how are you going to respond to that statement? How are you going to structure your answer or your response to that statement for your speech? Now, I want you to have a think about when you choose the order, you want the idea that they flow well together. And I use a bit of a visual metaphor in my class of steps versus stepping stones. So this idea that when you sequence your eyes, your ideas together so they flow well, it's like steps. Each point is connected to the next one. And it makes a logical progression up um, from the start to the finish. You've got a logical direction to go. Whereas with stepping stones, it's like you do one complete point and then you kind of make a dramatic leap to another. And then it's another, an, another dramatic leap to another. But there's no connection between them. There's no um, security. And obviously you could move those stones around and it wouldn't matter. And you don't then get that natural flow. So I just want you to have a think for 30 seconds using my exercise idea. 
And those five sort of subtopics within it, so this idea of weightlifting, competitive sport, stretching, well-being and personal best, just want you to have a think. How would you potentially order those ideas so that they flow well together? And I'm just going to give you about 30 seconds just to have a think about how you might order those so they go well together, so they flow together. 30 seconds, off you go. OK, this is the order that I've come up with and I'm going to talk you through why I've done this order just so you can sort of see my thought process. Um, and then you can see when you're doing your own planning, the sort of thought processes you're going to have to go through. So I've started off with exercise being essential for well-being and health in general. And I wanted to start with that because for me, that's the most important aspect of exercise. You know, we exercise to look after our own health, our own well-being, our own general sense of feeling all right. Um, and I thought that was the most important, so I wanted to start with that one. I then thought, well, if I do some examples of the sorts of exercises that are good for you, such as weights and the benefits of weightlifting, that would be a logical link um, because that makes it flow. So, again, this is essential health and well-being, for example, weightlifting and the benefit of weightlifting. Now, obviously, one of the key things about weightlifting is you've got to make sure your form is right. And I thought, well, I could tie that in with stuff about form and stretching properly afterwards and looking after your muscles and looking after the sort of repair side of things. Um, and again, that makes a logical thing. You know, weightlifting is only beneficial if you're doing it properly. If you're not doing it right, you're going to hurt yourself. So it's really important that your form and your stretching and your post-exercise care and all the rest of it is done well. So that makes sense. And then I thought, you know, when you've done it right, think about getting your personal best, the boosts it gives you, the sort of the psychological boost. And that almost then links back to the top point about your health and your well-being. So it creates that kind of sense of cohesion of the whole speech together. And then finally, you know, if you are really successful at it, that could even take you to competitions. And I put it could take you because let's face it, most of us are probably not going to enter some sort of weightlifting competition. Um and so saying that exercise is only good if you're going to make it at competition level isn't particularly helpful. But it's just a way of ending it saying, you know, if this is something you really enjoy, you could take it really seriously and you could take it further and go in for a competition just as a final point. Now, obviously, whatever order you've chosen, as long as you can talk it through and make sure that the flow is there, then it doesn't matter um, particularly. But it's just really thinking about why have I put... The idea that I've put second there and then why is idea number three there and just sort of talking through the links and sometimes having those bullet points like that and thinking about how you would talk through it is a really useful part of planning. Now this kind of planning does take time and what you'll need to do in preparation for your exam is practice planning so that you become quicker at it and that you become a little bit more um, confident with being able to see how that plan is going to work in action. For the article, when it says about um, an, you know, an event in your area, obviously the examiner is not going to know where you live. And so you have a little bit of freedom there. But you also want to think about what events could realistically happen in your area. So with nonfiction writing, although we do want to be creative and we do want to you know, engage our reader, it sometimes helps if you can really visualise something that is real and something that is happening. Over three. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Hay fever is horrendous at the moment. I, I have deep sympathy for any of you who are currently suffering. Um, so I want you to just have a think of what sort of events could realistically happen in your area. OK, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to have a think about what events could realistically happen in your area that you could write about for that local newspaper. Off you go.
Okay, so I've had to think about my area. Um, I live near the sea, so potentially some sort of sailing or boating um, event, some sort of, you know, um, regatta or gala or something like that. Um, we've got quite a, a big grassy area, so there could potentially be a fun fair or something like that on it. Or we could have a music festival um, that could happen in this area. So those are kind of the three of the things that I thought about. Obviously, you might have thought about something completely different. Um, you might have thought about something really similar, but it doesn't really matter as long as you've got an idea in your head of the sort of event that you could do. Now, one of the big things that we keep talking about during these lessons is this idea of authorial intent. You know, what are you as a writer trying to achieve? And I think before you go into planning, you need to have that authorial intent really clear in your head. What do you want this to be? So do you want your newspaper article to be a persuasive article that's trying to get people to attend the event? Do you want it to be an informative report after the event? And if you're going to do that, is it going to be positive or negative? You know, is it going to be really celebrating um, what has happened or is it going to be really critical of what has happened? So where I live, every summer there's a, a big event and one of the main news reports always after the event is the amount of litter that it creates. Um, and it's a really negative, scathing account of uh, just how much rubbish people put in the streets and how few people tidy up after themselves and the sort of the money that goes into tidying up. And it's all, you know, it happens every year. Um, and that's one style of report you could potentially go on to, that sort of aftermath and either positive or negative. And it might be that it's a positive one and people are really thrilled and, and what a great thing it was and they're hoping to do it again next year or... Um, it might be really negative in the idea that you know it could potentially be banned or something uh, is going to have to change. So when you think about the article, have a think about what the events from your list that we've just thought of, the realistic events that could happen um, in your area. And again, try and think of sort of five key elements associated with the event. So for me, I was thinking about a music festival and I want to persuade people to go. So that's my style of report. So again, thinking about anchoring my authorial intent early on. So I'm going to think about the bands on stage. You know, the main reason to go to a music festival is because you want to watch bands. So I've got to think about who are the bands going to be on stage. Um, there might also be an open mic event. If this is a local music festival, then local people are going to want to go. Um, and maybe having sort of like an open mic local talent stage might be a good idea. Um, I'm going to think about the food available um, that might interest people. You know, if you're going to go to a festival, festival food is, is sometimes a big draw. Um, how to buy tickets, how do you want to buy the tickets, uh, how do they get them, trying to make that seem really easy. And for me, my music festival is going to be supporting a charity, so I'm going to want to include some information about that. So just 30 seconds to think of five things from one of the events on your list um, that you could write about in an article. Off you go. OK. Right. So hopefully you've got um, a few things there. Again, if you need to pause so that you can get a few more down, that's fine. And again, think about the order of events. How are you going to order them so that they make sense? So for me, with the music festival, I'm going to start with the bands on stage. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I want to build up excitement with the headline acts. Remember, this is a persuasive article. I'm trying to convince people to go. I need to get them excited about the headline acts. On the open mic sessions is going to be next one because obviously I'm talking about the performances, I'm talking about the um, the stage, I'm talking about um, the bands that are going to be there. So it makes sense then to introduce new acts and local groups and more about people, try and build that in. Um, because I'm talking about local groups, I'm then going to talk about the local food trucks um, that are coming in, the um, sort of locally sourced produce um, that's going to be there, about supporting the economy, the local economy. And then that's going to link to the charity it's supporting and any requests for donations and then where the tickets are available. And I want to make it really easy for people to get tickets. So that's kind of my flow um, of those five elements there. And you can see how that's going to build up. So in terms of getting started, you want a really powerful start. OK, you really want to think about crafting openings. 
And so for the speech, the main thing you're going to sort of start with is a salutation. So a greeting or address for your audience. And you want to set the tone for the outset. OK, so what is the register, the formality that you're going for? So I'm going to give you about 10 seconds with each of the following openings and greetings below. And I just want you to think about how you would describe the formality and tone. So the first one we've got is, hey, and it might be, hey, team, hey, people, um, you know, hey, year seven, if that's who you're talking about. But hey. OK, the next salutation is just a symbol hello. And have a think, what's the difference between starting it with hello or hey? OK, so 10 seconds just to have a think. We've then got good morning. OK, possibly um, a different sort of tone, a different sort of and relationship between the speaker and the audience established there. And then I want you to think about if they just started with, I'm here today to talk about, rather than any kind of salutation or greeting, I just want you to think about the effect of that. Okay, so 10 seconds. OK, now hopefully you've kind of picked up on the idea that depending on who your audience is, you know, if you're doing an assembly for year seven students as somebody higher up the school, then a, a casual sort of, hey, hey, year seven, really good to see you. Um, today we're going to chat about whatever it is that you're talking about. That would be a perfectly acceptable way to do it because there is a friendly relationship there. But obviously, if you're trying to address um you know, a more formal audience, that's not going to be appropriate. And so you really need to think about the tone of your piece and what you're aiming for in order to get that salutation um, sort of hitting the mark. We're also, we've also been talking a lot about audience positioning and an effective persuasive or argumentative speech requires you to position the audience so they share your values, so that you are convincing them. And it might be that you are having to move them away from an opinion that they hold um, which is quite hard, or it might be that you're just trying to convince them of an opinion they should share and you're trying to make that um, sort of opinion stronger. Um, but you're going to be using a lot of different techniques to try and position um, the audience to agree with you. And one of the most effective ways to do that is you need to establish the idea that you are correct in your beliefs, you know, that what you think is right and therefore they should share the um, beliefs with you. So you need to be convincing, and that comes down to the delivery of your speech. You need to be confident when you're delivering it so that you sound certain and believable and trustworthy. And that's as much to do when you're speaking with your tone of voice and your body language as it is to do with the words that you've written. Now, obviously, for your non-fiction writing exam, all you've got is your words. So you need to think about ways that you can use language to make yourself sound more certain. And in lesson two, where we looked at using language, language effectively, we had things like modal verbs to show certainty. So this will happen and this must happen. Um, and you can always go back and watch lesson two as a way of just reminding yourself of some of those language features that show that certainty. So I want you to have a think about the start and making your purpose clear. OK, so this is um, for the exercise one. I just want you to think about how does this speak? speech introduce the topic effectively? How does this opening introduce the topic effectively? So, hello and welcome. How many of you feel that you exercise enough? If you're anything like me, you probably feel like you could do more, but you're also struggling to motivate yourself to do it. We all know exercise is important for physical health, but it's also really important for your emotional and mental well-being. Okay, so just have a think. How? 10 seconds. How does that introduce the topic effectively? What things have you spotted that make it a strong opening?
Okay, so you might have picked up on the fact that it repeats the focus of the speech, the exercise and exercise is mentioned all the way through. It hints at the persuasive element of the speech. You know, you're struggling to motivate yourself to do it. You kind of know that this speech, therefore, is going to be talking about trying to get you motivated and trying to convince you to do it. And it sets up the first argument, you know, we know it's important, okay? And it's about to kind of go in and prove, well, that's important. So now I'm going to look at the same extract, and we're just going to think about how does it position the audience to share the opinions of the speaker? So how does this opening position you to go, oh, yeah, no, I agree with that, I agree with what this person is saying, or to make a connection with what the um, author is saying? So just going to give you 10 seconds just to have a quick think. Obviously, if you need more time to look over it, feel free to pause. OK, so again, some of the things that I've picked up, this idea of a direct address builds up a connection to the audience and it makes the audience feel normal. And again, that's normal in inverted commas because there's no real such thing. But this idea of, well, if you're like me or if you're like a lot of us or if, you know, for a lot of people, that idea of creating a sense that we belong to a community of people who share the same views is a really powerful tool at persuading people to do what you want them to do. Um, it also assumes knowledge between the audience and the speaker. We all know exercise is important. Well, we do, don't we? We know it's an important thing to do. And if you said to somebody, uh, should you exercise, everybody would go, oh, yeah, you should because it's good for you. And there is that sort of common belief in it. And again, by putting that over there, we all know exercise is important. Immediately, what you're doing is kind of nodding and agreeing with the speaker. So they've already positioned you to agree with them. They've already positioned you to um, believe what they're saying. And again, a really effective persuasive tool. And then this bit, you know, we know it's important for physical health, but it's also important for your emotional and mental well-being. There's an assumption that we care about those things. Now, again, some of you might be sitting there going, well, yeah, obviously, miss. but that's what audience positioning is about. It's about making your audience go, oh, yeah, well, obviously. But they're saying, oh, yeah, well, obviously, but they're obviously agreeing with you. And so you've got them kind of hooked into that um, pattern of agreeing with you and sharing your beliefs, which is a really powerful tool for making your persuasive speech work. Now, this is my slightly dafter one with looking at seagulls and um, pandas, seagulls being better than pandas. And again, I just want you to have a think about how does this speech introduce the topic effectively? Because I've gone for something slightly different than the exercise one. So, good morning. It is a simple fact that seagulls are better than pandas. Now, I appreciate that some of you may argue against me. You may, in fact, mock my beliefs that the terrifying birds that stalk seafronts and playgrounds up and down the country are in some ways superior to the fluffy black and white cuties that represent the World Wildlife Fund. But I'm here to convince you that they are. And to take it a step further, I will convince you that they are not in some way superior. They are in every way superior. OK, so. How does that set up the speech? OK, and set up the topic, just going to give you again 10 seconds to have a think. OK, now I've got a really blunt opening on this. It's a simple fact that seagulls are better than pandas. And then it sets up the goals and the aims of the speech in a very over, very explicit, very obvious way. I am here to convince you that they are. I am going to show you that they are in every way superior. Um, you know, this idea that this is my setup. And so there's a real clarity there. And you might want to have a think about um, how you could use that for the topics that you've chosen um, from the start of today's lesson. And again, think about the audience positioning. You know, how does this speaker position the audience to share their opinions? Now, I imagine that for most people, if I said to you, which is the better animal, a seagull or a panda, I doubt whether many people would say seagull because, you know, they're a, a not a particularly attractive um, animal, some might say. And, you know, they go through your bins and they make a lot of noise and they're quite difficult to manage. And so it might be, a difficult thing that I'm trying to persuade, but I just want you to have a think, how has this opening tried to position the speaker to share their opinions? So again, just 10 seconds, just having a think. And like I said, if you need to pause, feel free to pause.
Okay. So the opening, it is a simple fact that seagulls are better than pandas. It implies it's obvious. It implies you should agree with, you know, with me as a speaker. Um, it's a simple fact. You have to agree with it. It's an obvious one. Now, obviously, that is not a fact. It's an opinion. But by presenting it as a fact, I'm trying to make it more convincing. I'm trying to make it more... Um, obvious that you should agree with what I'm talking about now I acknowledge the difference of opinion but I kind of disregard it you know I'm here to convince you they are they are better okay you might mock it but they are better and then this modal verb I will convince you that they are not in some way superior they are in every way superior that is me being really certain and really confident this is what is going to happen and so what I'm doing there is I'm positioning the audience to prepare to have their opinion changed I'm setting it up that this is going to make a difference um, so hopefully you can see some of the techniques used there. Now, in terms of the article, one of the key um, phrases or one of the key terminology pieces that you need here is the idea of journalese. And that's the sensationalist style of writing associated with newspapers. Um, and I imagine that a lot of you have got different methods of remembering this. So um, when the time of the event is clearly established, where um, it establishes the location, and the what helps to summarise the key events. Some of you might have the five W's, so when, what, where, why, and how, um, who on there as well, I think. Um, I seem to have missed one. But yeah, so you've got those that sort of technique. But you can see here on this one, you know, next weekend sees the launch of the first ever Gillingham Music Festival on Gillingham Common. Now you can see by setting up with that time and when it is and the way that that is structured sounds like a newspaper because journalese is a very specific style and so reading newspapers to get yourself familiar with that journalese is really important. So that opening there next weekend sees the launch of the first ever Gillingham Music Festival on Gillingham Common. Over 10,000 residents and visitors are expected to descend on the area to watch a range of both established and new acts as they try and raise funds for a new community centre. And you can see here that there's some of that sensationalist language to build up excitement. It's the first ever one. Over 10,000 people are going to be there. They're trying to raise funds for a new community. You know, there's the idea of a, a struggle and a battle there. And there's hundreds, of, you know, thousands of people coming and it's the first ever one. So it's exciting. And so you can see there how that journalese is really working to boost the excitement and to hook the reader in from the outset. Now, this is a purple task just to give you um, a bit of a, a chance to have a go um, at playing around with journalese. So I've done little summaries of two stories. So the first one, um, the Hackham Sailing Gala is an annual event. Every year, over a thousand boats take part in a number of different events. This year is the first time that speedboats have been permitted to join, but some people think they shouldn't be involved. OK, so that's a brief, brief summary of what the, the article is going to be about. So you want to think, how could you rewrite that so it sounds more like journalism, sounds more exciting, sounds more sensationalist? And then the next one, the fun fair was on Downland Common for over two weeks. When the fun fair left, there was a lot of rubbish and mess. This has made the residents of the area very angry. OK, and so, again, a really brief summary of a story. And I want you to see if you can rewrite it so they sound like proper newspaper articles and you've got the journalese there. OK, so some of the structure strategies you might want to use um, within your um, speeches and within your articles um, are linked to the sort of things that we looked at in lesson three, where we were analysing the sort of structural devices that um, writers use. So you want to have a think about the ones that you can use that make your writing more effective. And regardless of whether this is we're talking about your spoken language endorsement or your nonfiction writing, you'll be talking about manipulating the reader and using a range of devices to do that. And so having a few at your fingertips that you're really confident with using is a really good idea. Now, I've put together this list of um, devices. Some of them you'll be really familiar with. Some of them you won't be. Um, these are just some of the ones that I really like using and I really like teaching. Um, and I'm going to go through a couple of the more unusual ones. Um, I'm not going to go through them all because we don't have time. I'm going to go through a couple of the more unusual ones so that you can just see them in action. Now, I know some of you might have things like Duff Forest or A Forest or other acronyms to help you remember what to include in your speeches. And those are obviously really valid to use as well. Um, but sometimes it's just nice to have a, a repertoire of things that you can employ. So the first one I'm going to look at is an aphora, which is um, the repetition of the same sort of stem, the same sentence stem. Um, and it tends to come at the beginning of sentences. 
So you can see here, uh, this is a part of the seagull speech. You cannot ignore the fact that seagulls have managed to make our world their own. You cannot ignore the fact that seagulls will sample any food to keep themselves going. And you cannot ignore that this is completely the opposite for pandas. Just have a think, again, little 10 second think. How does this help to position the audience to share the values of the text? OK, just 10 seconds. OK, now hopefully this idea of this sort of repeated structure of you cannot ignore, you cannot ignore, you cannot ignore um, allows you to uh, convince your audience that they have to pay attention to these points. And actually that rhythmic anaphora makes things very predictable. And you kind of you get people into going, oh, yeah, OK, now that's true. You can't ignore the fact that seagulls have managed to make the world their own. Yeah, that's true. You can't ignore that they will eat anything. Oh, yeah, no, that's true can't ignore that pandas are completely opposite. Oh, yeah, OK. And then suddenly you've got them agreeing with you that seagulls are doing something better than pandas, something different than pandas, and you're starting to move them into that um, agreement position. Now, obviously, you can see that, that there are three of those. So that's, um, again, a triadic or a tricolonic structure, um, magic three, rules of three, triples, whatever um, you, you call them. Um, and this is the thing with some of these devices. They don't exist in isolation, you know, um, a a triadic structure on an aphora um, can be the same thing. Um, and the reason that they sort of blend over is because we have certain things that appeal to us as, as listeners. Um, and this is one of them. So, you know, don't worry if you're looking at something and going, well, I'd have called that a rule of three. Well, yeah, because it is, it's a triple. Um, but sometimes it's nice to have the more sophisticated terminology to go with it. Um, Hyperfora is a rhetorical question where the speaker then gives an answer immediately afterwards. So um, you're using a question, then offering an answer straight away. So in this one, this is from the exercise speech. Are you sure you don't have a spare 30 minutes a day? Think about the time you spend on social media, the time you spend watching silly YouTube videos of cats, or even the time you spend watching something awful on television. Could you find the time from there? Let's be honest, you probably could. Now, what we've done there is, can you find the time? Let's be honest, you can. OK, there is an answer there. That's the hyperfora that's going on at the end there. But I just want you to have a think about why has this speech been ordered in this way? And I'm actually going to make this a purple task. You can come back and have a look at that in a bit. But just think about why start with the question about the spare 30 minutes, then list the things that people might waste time doing and then have that. Could you find the time? Yeah, let's be honest, you could. And think about the order of it. Think about how that sort of order has happened. Because you can see there that the the reader or the, the speaker is almost taking away the excuse from the audience and positioning themselves to go, oh, yeah, I probably do waste 30 minutes a day on stuff that I could do something more productive with. Um, and I think you can, you know, you can kind of see why the order is in that way. OK, so parallelism. Parallelism creates a sense of symmetry within writing, and it's where we've got the same sort of roots and stems within a sentence um, or within a few phrases that kind of create that gentle rhythm and we can kind of almost predict what happens and that's really appealing to a listener. So I'm just going to read this bit out. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to have a think about how does the rhythm engage the reader and how does the parallelism make the final sentence more effective, okay? I'm not expecting you to love seagulls, not expecting you to love their raucous squawks or love their tendency to rip your bins apart. But I am expecting you to respect their determination to survive. So just have a think about how that parallelism works to hook you in. OK, and you can see this idea of the not expecting, not expecting, not expecting, but I am expecting. And actually what we then have is by sort of moving slightly away from that parallelism to the I am expecting you, it makes that final sentence stand out much more dramatically. And then finally, um, we're going to have a look at antithesis. And antithesis is basically kind of use opposites um, close together as a way of making things stand out. So a small sacrifice in terms of time and effort will bring about huge rewards in terms of health and well-being. And that idea of exercise being only a little thing you do, but the benefits being massive helps to exaggerate why you'd want to exercise. 
Um, pandas eat almost nothing but bamboo, a plant with so little nutritional value that it's practically pointless. Seagulls eat almost everything. Their refusal to be picky eaters helps ensure their survival. And again, by using antithesis, I'm setting up pandas and seagulls as sort of almost complete opposite creatures. Um, and again, trying to show that seagulls are superior because they will um, eat anything rather than being really picky. Um, and so that helps to kind of engage the audience and helps to um, add those position the audience into sharing my beliefs when we look at the article the structural devices that you're kind of looking at you're looking at sort of creating cohesion and coherence so cohesion is uh, the features that hold a text together and the coherence is the quality of being logical and consistent so that it makes sense and often they rely on a number of different techniques to create cohesion and coherence within the text and you'll need to think about those features that you use so this is my article and I've used some discourse markers and we went through discourse markers in lesson three. Um, but hopefully you can see how I've made the article flow and connect with each other. Um, just before we sort of go on, I want to, one of the glossary words on here, the word plethora just means many, just means a, a multitude of, a lot of. Um, but I think everything else in here is fairly straightforward. So um, next weekend sees the launch of the first ever Gillingham Music Festival on Gillingham Common. Over 10,000 residents and visitors are expected to descend on the area to watch a range of both established and new acts as they try and raise funds for a new community centre. The critically acclaimed dystopian backlash and indie legend's fertile imagination are among the headliners that are expected to draw big crowds at this Saturday's event. But local favourites back into the air are also hoping to wow the gathering throng with their popular tracks, Mercy and Knowing and Day One. There will also be a number of smaller stages where open mic events will help showcase new talent and festival goers can sign up ahead of time on the festival's website www.gmf2020.com. As well as local talent and singers, the festival will also feature a plethora of food trucks providing delicious locally sourced fare that will delight every palate. This year's theme is all about sustainability and the food trucks have all committed to only using 100% compostable or recyclable packaging. Just like the festival, the new community centre is also aiming to be a fully sustainable and eco-friendly building, using the latest developments in non-toxic materials and recycled insulation. Donations for the centre and tickets can be purchased on the festival's website or over the counter at the Tourist Information Centre on the High Street. Now you can see there that I'm making connections with, you know, the established and new acts are the critically acclaimed dystopian backlash and indie legends, but then we've also got the new ones, you know, the the new um, local favourites are also hoping and there will also be smaller stages with open mic events and as well as local talent there's going to be local food and you can see here how these discourse markers and these signposts are connecting the sections of the text together these sort of adverbial phrases are connecting the text together um, as a way of flowing through now this is probably shorter than anything you'd produce in the exam but hopefully you can see how that article flows and how it ends and when we're talking about finishing strong, something you might want to think about, the primacy recency effect, now this is a psychological term, and I know that a lot of you might be thinking about doing A-level psychology after your GCSEs. And this basically says we remember the first thing and the last thing we hear much better than anything in the middle. And so you want to think about the start and the finish. So for me, remember my article is a persuasive article, so I'm going to end with donations for the centre and tickets can be purchased on the festival's website or over the counter at the Tourist Information Centre on the High Street, because I want people to remember how to give money, how to pay for tickets, how to get involved, because it, that's the main purpose of my article. Um, so, oh, I've just answered that question, how does the ending help support the purpose of the article? Um, but you can see there how I've tried to keep them focused on what, um, what I want to achieve. How does that help position the audience in terms of the expectations? Just have a think for a second. And hopefully what you've seen there is, you know, donations for the centre and tickets can be purchased. By writing that, I am assuming that they want to know that, that they want to buy tickets, that they want to give donations. And so I've actually positioned them into a, a point where they're like, oh, OK, I should probably go and get a ticket. Or that sounds really easy. I better do that. Um, and it's just a way of persuading them to get involved. And then again, that what does the article want the audience to take from this? It's the idea that this is very simple. Um, you know, donations for the centre and tickets can be purchased on the website or they can be um, given over the counter. You know, this is a simple process. 
Another technique you can use in your speech is the idea of a topic loop, so returning back to a previous topic. So thinking about my opening, which was about struggling to motivate yourself to exercise, and then this idea in the middle that I had about finding the extra time, you know, let's be honest, you probably could. My final comment is going to be, ultimately, I know this speech isn't going to magic you an extra half an hour a day, but hopefully I've convinced you to magic it for yourself. Thank you for listening. Now, this idea of, you know, you finding the extra time and taking responsibility and, you know, actually working to fit that in is the thread of the whole piece. So again, coming back to that idea of motivating yourself and getting yourself um, committed to giving that half an hour is a really interesting way of, of ending the speech. Or you could summarise it using discourse markers such as finally or in conclusion. Now, what I really want to say about this is the minute you say finally or in conclusion, your audience is going to start preparing to end the speech. You know, and that might be an applause or that might be to leave the room or that might be to think about what's going on next. So if you do that finally, you need to make sure it's your final point. And you know how this works. And, I've, you know, I've seen it myself. If I say sort of seven or eight minutes towards the end of the lesson, Right, okay, so next lesson we are going to. Instantly, my students are kind of thinking, oh, that's my timer gone. Uh, over time again, sorry, guys. Um, when you know what it's like in the classroom, when your teacher starts going next lesson, you're instantly thinking, oh, that must be the end of the lesson. And you sort of mentally start packing up. And then they're like, oh, I haven't finished yet. And it's like, oh, okay, well, you'd given me the signal that this was over. And so finally, or in conclusion, kind of acts like that. So you need to make sure it is your final point. So finally, while I fully appreciate the pandas are pathetically in danger and in desperate need of our help, I believe that seagulls are without a doubt worthy of our respect. I hope you do too. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? And so it's a really short final point. Your audience isn't going to be looking out the door for ages and missing something really key. So a quick overview of the spoken language endorsement then. Regardless of what exam board you're in, you'll be expected to perform a short speech for your SLE qualification and it's awarded separately from your GCSE. So it's not part of, um, you know, it doesn't contribute to your final GCSE. You get a separate mark and that's a distinction, a merit or a pass. And the mark scheme is the same regardless of the exam board, but you have to meet each element of the level to be awarded that mark. So if you had ticks across the board for distinction apart from in one area that was a merit, you would only get a merit. All right, you have to tick everything in order to get the, the level that you're on. So that's a brief overview of the mark scheme. OK, that's something that you can go back and have a read through carefully um, to have a look at, particularly this column in green in the middle here um, that has to happen for all levels of speech. And so you need to have a think about, OK, what does that mean for me? What am I going to have to practice? I'm going to have a quick overview with the distinction. I think just because if you aim high and slip, you're going to sort of slip to a merit. Whereas if you're sort of aiming in the middle, um, you could drop lower than that. And also we don't have time to go through everything. I mean, I've already overrun, but um, we don't have time to go through everything. So I just want to kind of whiz through this so that you've got a bit of a, a thing to think about. So for the distinction, the sophisticated ideas, you need to think about something that's quite challenging so it's going to make your audience think a bit and that's why I quite like things like the you know the panda and seagull thing because it's a bit of an unusual topic to think about um, and is a bit of a challenge and the same with you know the um, e-games at the Olympics you know lots of people have really strong opinions about whether computer games can be considered a sport and so you might want to think about something that's a bit challenging and that's going to give you the opportunity to use a sophisticated repertoire of vocabulary, so a nice range of vocabulary and devices that are going to be um, interesting to your audience. This range of um, strategies to engage the audience, those rhetorical devices that we looked at earlier in the lesson, those are all things that you can use as a way of hooking in your reader and some of the strategies that you can use. And this is going to be really important about the planning and the structuring and the way that your points are going to connect to each other. So you've got that range of devices to keep them interested and the, the flow is very natural. You've got to achieve the purpose of your presentation. And again, for me, it's about having a clear purpose. You need to know exactly what you want to achieve before you set out. What do you want to be able to talk about? What do you want your audience to sort of end up feeling or responding by the end of it? And then the final bit, you're going to have to um, respond and elaborate on feedback and questions and stuff like that. 
And so you need to think about the sort of questions somebody might ask you about your speech. You also need to make sure you know it really well, know the topic really well, so that if somebody does ask you a question, you can answer it. Um, but you also need to think about how could you elaborate on a response. So, for example, with the seagulls and pandas one, if somebody said to me, are seagulls your favourite animal? And that's a closed question. I could answer that with a simple yes or no. But that's not going to get me into that distinction. So if they said to you, are seagulls your favourite animal? I would go, no, actually, probably my favourite animals are cats because um, I find their personalities really excellent. But what I really admire about a seagull is the fact that um, they've made our world their own, despite the fact we've encroached on the habitat. They have blossomed. They're really strong. They're quite defensive of their chicks. They, um, you know, really have committed to survival and I think I find that really admirable I've expanded and elaborated on what could be a closed question and I've given more information and so you need to practice that element as well now if you wrote a three minute speech you'd need somewhere around about 500 words depending on how quickly you speak and in your non-fiction exam this is roughly the length for most people's responses I think it's between about 300 and 500 words depending on your exam board and so actually the skills you need for writing a speech in your exam and the skills for thinking about your speech for your SLE are quite similar. Um, and one thing you can do, and again, this is a purple task for later, um, is to record yourself reading words out loud. Now, I've done this 50 word um, extract here just so you can get an idea of how quickly you speak. And you should listen back to yourself to check your tone. Now, I know that's hideous. I know listening to yourself talk when it's been recorded is not necessarily comfortable for most of us but you really need to think about where are you putting the emphasis where are you putting the pace can you hear yourself because actually a lot of people when they speak when they're nervous are so quick um, that it's almost unintelligible you can't make out the words now there's a lot of videos on youtube for uh, preparing for the sle i've put some links to these um but you can have a look at others. But um, these are just some that you might want to have a start with. And again, they're purple tasks for you to have a look at later. So if you haven't done your SLE yet, it might be worth looking at some of these videos to get yourself um, going so you know what's what and what's expected of you. So final review then. These are the things that we've looked at today. It, you know, when you're doing your nonfiction writing, really know what you're aiming for. Plan carefully. Make sure your opening is strong. Make sure you've got a range of strategies within there. Make sure you've got your final powerful statement. And then for the spoken language endorsement, give yourself a chance to rehearse and practice um, and really think about responding to questions. So it's always worth talking in front of someone else to see what sort of questions they come up with. The key terms that we've gone through today, those are the ones that are in the main body of the lesson and those are the rhetorical vice devices again. Again, if you've got any feedback, please let me know. We're looking at narrative and fiction writing next lesson. So anything you want me to cover in that one, let me know. Um, the QR code is there. And the next lesson is going to be the 1st of July, which is a terrifying uh, thing for me. And it will be 11 o'clock um, on the 1st. Um, thanks ever so much for that. I hope this has been helpful. Um, wishing you all the best for those of you back in school or those of you that are not. Um, I know that you're all working hard out there um, and I wish you the very best. Take care. Bye.